From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hello and welcome to The Hub. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz was in China from April 14th through 16th. It was his second visit since assuming office. As we commemorate the 10th anniversary of the comprehensive strategic partnership between China and Germany, how significant was this visit in shaping the future trajectory of China-Germany relations? And with German direct investment in China reaching a record high last year, how can German businesses further tap into China's vast potential in the coming years? To explore all these issues, I'm very pleased to be joined by Maximilian First, President and CEO of Zeiss China. Zeiss is a centrizal German manufacturer of optics, industrial measurements and medical devices company. How does the company plan to tap into the smart manufacturing, also known as Industry 4.0, and how does China play into this? How can China provide the expertise and the solutions to innovate and grow? Here's our conversation. Max, welcome to The Hub on CGTN. Good morning. Great having you. Good morning there. We've seen German Chancellor Schultz visiting China. It is his second trip in recent memory. His you know, tour in Diaoyu Tai State Guest House with President Xi Jinping of China. The two walked alongside each other. Seeing these visuals and uh, these reports, what signals do you think this visit send to those watching this bilateral relationship? Okay, so uh, obviously I cannot speak in the name of the government or industry, but I think here uh, as a company uh, watching this and based in China, I think there are a couple of uh, elements. First of all, I think this visit was significant both in terms of its length, three days, and also uh, its timing. I think we are all aware that we are in geopolitically fraught times, uh, but here was really a constructive way of moving forwards, bringing up topics where Germany and China as two long-standing trade partners with a lot of areas of cooperation focused on topics where we can move forward together and progress in terms of trade and cooperation. I would see here in particular the topics of sustainability and innovation as very important factors. As representing a company, Zeiss, who's very much in these areas, actually I see this as a very positive signal moving forward. What specifics have you seen coming out of this summit in terms of economic, trade and investment relationships between China and Germany? I think two aspects. We've seen some, some concrete uh, results, in particularly on the agricultural side, where I think now we're going to see uh, a, a further increase in trade, which had been slowed down in, in the past year. So I think this is a very concrete topic. I think then the second biggest element is really uh, a feeling of confidence moving forward that uh, really as companies we want and we can continue investing uh, in China in, in a safe environment and, and more, how should I say, controllable environment. Yeah, we know Zeiss is a manufacturer of uh, optics, uh, industrial measurements, medical devices, uh, has been in China for quite a while. How is Zeiss uh, positioning China in light of all that has happened uh, post-COVID years, economic recovery, different uh, estimates, projections about the future of Chinese economy? Realistically, the position of China for Zeiss has not changed dramatically through all these times. I think the importance of China is still there and continues growing. I'll put it in a, a quite simple way, actually. If you look at the expected global economic growth from 2023 to 2028, of the absolute amount of wealth created in the world, more than 20% will be generated by China. This is double what is going to be generated by the US economy, which means for a company, a multinational like Zeiss, which is currently making 80% of its business revenue, innovation and manufacturing outside of its borders, China is the, if A, if not the, major market. You cannot be successful as a global ma multinational nowadays without being heavily and strongly engaged in the China market. So I think uh, for us, we have seen the opportunity, we are acting on the opportunity and we continue engaging in China, both in terms of sales for the size of the market, also as a manufacturing and supply chain hub, but also more importantly, moving forward, more and more innovation together in and for China, but also for the world. Max, what do you make of China's economic growth figure that's been just released at 5.3% growth in the first quarter? 
I must say I was quite surprised how positive I think many of us out in the market were not expecting such a good number. I think it's a very, uh, very strong signal, positive signal moving forward. But I think we must be realistic that there are substantial strains on the Chinese economy today. Uh, we are feeling it in some of the businesses, but I think the general trend is extremely positive and the opportunity for the future is still there. Um, if I look more on our specific uh, consumer-oriented business, actually we had a very positive Chinese New Year season, so that was quite an uplift. This is perhaps what we're seeing also in other industries and which was reflected in, in the gross numbers. As a whole, German direct investment in China saw a notable increase of 4.3% last year, reaching a record high of 11.9 billion euros, according to official Bundesbank data. What do you think is behind such numbers and what does it tell us about um, a German investors, how they look at the post-pandemic Chinese market? So I think if you look at the Chinese economy, you have a long-term trajectory, which is an extremely positive trajectory. Over the last decade, China as an economy has done many things right, which means, for example, if you look at the amount of investments which have gone into industrial upgrade, if you look at a focus in investments in research and development, innovation, these are topics which in the medium and long term are going to pay out for the growth of the economy. And this is why I think there's a general very strong confidence in the long term trajectory of the Chinese economy. Of course, as everywhere, you have shorter cycles of up and down. Covid was a knock, but I think it's not going to impact the long term trajectory of the company. So if you're looking at this in terms of investments and companies investing, every company obviously has its own reasons. But if I look at Zeiss, we clearly believe in the continued growth uh, of the China market and we are actually doubling down on our investments. Our investments are somewhat shifting, whereas in the prior decades you were maybe seeing more investments in, how should I say, manufacturing, we are now seeing much more investments going deeper into the supply chain, more partnerships, potential M&As, and then of course a real doubling down in research and development and innovation uh, investments in the country because the country has changed. And we see more and more innovation coming out of China. And as a global company, we must be present in the market here with the local researchers, with the local partners, to drive but also to benefit from the innovation which is happening in the country. Does the you know, short chaining of uh, supply chains, French shoring and geopolitical headwinds in any way affected your businesses in China? Of course there have been some short term impacts uh, but generally and I think this is often underestimated, companies and economies have an incredible capability to adapt to new environments. And this is what we have been doing. By small shifts, clearly we are seeing that the integration level of the economy which we experienced 10 years ago is no longer there. So I think what we're looking at is much more looking at a regionalization of our capabilities, both in terms of manufacturing, sourcing and research and development, so that basically uh, we are more resilient to any potential changes and that we have less long chains of logistics which could potentially be impacted by geopolitical unrests. Zeiss has also stepped up its investment in China last month. A new quality excellence center was launched in Dongguan in South China. It's a manufacturing hub. Uh, tell us more about it. Uh, why is Zeiss deciding to set up this new venture? Okay, so this is quite a specific area. It's uh, in our area of um, uh, industrial quality, uh, where obviously um, the Bay Area and Dongguan in particular is a real hub in terms of electronics, new energy vehicles, high-tech industry. And here this is part of our strategy with what we call our quality excellence centers. To be extremely close to our customers, not only to be able to demonstrate our tools, but also to perform training and then also develop applications together with our customers. So it's, it's our way of reaching out deeper into the customer base. And of course, the Greater Bay Area 
is extremely important. We have a lot of partners. Uh, I think everybody is aware we cooperate and we work together with Vivo, for example. They are based out of, out of Dongguan. So this is just one example of the types of investments we are doing throughout the country. This is more focused on really reaching out to our customers. We have a whole row of investments which are uh, ongoing, not only in the Greater Bay Area where we have our hub for uh, consumer optics and manufacturing, but also here in uh, the Yangtze Delta area where we have our regional headquarters and, and research center in Shanghai. In a few months time, we will be opening a brand new manufacturing and research and development uh, site uh, in Suzhou, for example, which will be focused on precision optics and mechanics, both in the areas of industrial, research microscopy and medical equipment. So you can see it's part of a picture where Zeiss is really broadening its footprint in the Chinese market and really creating hubs of excellence which are also important in the complete global R&D network of the Zeiss Group. Right, we know that uh, in terms of revenue, Zeiss grew by about 22% year on year. If you could look at the fiscal year 2022 to 2023, how does that compare against revenues from other regions and countries of Zeiss and other German companies perhaps? And what is behind such figures? Uh, I think there are several elements behind these figures. So um, uh, first of all, this is a trend, give or take a couple of percentages, which uh, we've been experiencing now for several years and which we foresee continuing uh, in the future. So this is basically the growth trend we look at. I think there are two elements which come together. One is clearly the direction China is taking and the investments of uh, the Chinese economy. What we are seeing today in China is really a transformation from quantity to quality. We see this in upgrading in innovation, we see this in an upgrading of uh, the manufacturing tool. And what is required to do this transformation and to drive this transformation fits perfectly to basically the capabilities of the Zeiss Group. Our whole business of industrial and quality research, which focuses on um, uh, high-end research microscopy, but also tools for quality control, are the instruments manufacturers need to be able to scale up in terms of quality. So this is driving our business. You may see quite a lot of industrial companies today which were more focused on, how should I say, the quantity expansion, which are now facing issues. We are seeing and profiting from the upgrade of the Chinese industry. So this is one area where we are active. The second area where we're active is more on the uh, eye healthcare area, where of course uh, uh, China has itself a whole set of issues. One is aging populations, but the second one is also the scourge which we have with myopia right now, where Zeiss is offering solutions and driving these solutions into the market and cooperating with the local economy. So I'd say it's a mix of a positive environment, business environment in China, and then more specific to our company, a very nice fit between basically our areas of competence and the, the current issues and topics which are driving uh, the Chinese economy. Right, Max, I want to pick your brain on technology uh, or industry 4.0. Zeiss is a centuries old company with a history spending some 170 years. They provided optical components for uh, you know, earlier lunar missions to the United States, the Apollo program, for example, uh, with its lenses famously used by none other than Neil Armstrong, uh, a small step for man, a giant leap for mankind, uh, the first person ever to set foot on the moon. They also collaborated with companies like Apple and Vivo, a Chinese smartphone company. Uh, what technologies and applications are you working on right now? And looking ahead, how does your company uh, intend to fully tap into this industry 4.0? Okay, so I, I think there are two big topics we're looking at. One is Industry 4.0, the other one is also AI, which is kind of coming even uh, probably faster and stronger. In the area of uh, Industry 4.0, we see it from two different aspects. One is internally in the company, how 
do we implement the, the principles of Industry 4.0 to be more efficient and effective as a company? I was speaking earlier to you about uh, our base um, in, in uh, Guangdong in the Greater Bay Area, uh, where there we have substantial uh, manufacturing facilities uh, for uh, lenses, for eye care lenses. And here we are really fully integrating the concepts of uh, Industry 4.0, where basically our machines are speaking to one another to have a seamless process from basically the raw material coming in at one end and having basically an individualized eyeglass for the consumer, which are then shipped throughout China and the region. Which means thanks to Industry 4.0, you can be in a situation where in an optical store, for a specific customer, there will be an individualized order done. And a few days later, you will be seeing this product coming out of manufacturing and being delivered to that. Everything is seamlessly communicating. All the machines are talking to one another. You can track the lens throughout this area. These are the type of technologies we are implementing in-house, which are really bringing Industry 4.0 alive. Then through our division for uh, um, industrial uh, quality systems. We are using some of this know-how and bringing it to our customers for them to enable uh, to really bring their complete manufacturing together. And here the important things in Industry 4.0 is not having individual machines in a process doing their job, but having them communicating with one another so that they share the data and then basically you can control, uh, for example, in the quality process across your factories worldwide, how the different processes are operating, if there are any deviations, how can I correct the deviations and transfer learning from one factory site to another to optimize the whole process. So really great stuff happening. That sounds fascinating. Fascinating indeed. And how do you think AI will come into the whole picture? I think AI is going to come a lot quicker than we expected and probably will be even more transformational than many of the transformations we have experienced in the last, uh, in the last few years. We can see starts of this and I think uh, for many of us we don't really know exactly where this is heading. Uh, but we already see very strong application in our businesses which are really going to transform the types of products and solutions we can bring to the customer. If you look at it, uh, Zeiss in many areas is a generator of image. Uh, we manufacture machines with optical systems uh, which are taking images of the eye, of the brain, of different areas of, of uh, machine parts. And in fact what you do is you have a lot of data which needs to be processed and shared. And what AI will be bringing is that it's not only enabling us to show the data and have a human interpret it, it's then going to be capable of interpreting what the data is telling us, connecting it together. If you transfer this now into day-to-day -day applications, it means, for example, in the area of healthcare, we manufacture a lot of products for the diagnosis of eye diseases. We take an image of the retina of the back of the eye. China, for example, has an issue that we've got excellent doctors in the big cities, but if you spread out in tier two, tier three cities, often you are lacking sufficient qualified doctors to be doing a good diagnosis. We are now looking at putting artificial intelligence into our system so that a relatively less well-trained person can take an image of the back of the eye, and then it's artificial intelligence which is interpreting this image and saying, or oh, this patient is okay, no problem, or this patient potentially has an issue. And it's the AI which is reading the image and then passing on that information so that that uh, patient can then be transferred to a higher level hospital. These are the first steps we are doing now in AI on how to do it together. Um, and if you look at a lot of our systems, we have complete workflows where topics are connected. And this is where AI can really help it. So this is directly an application. We see the same now in our manufacturing sites. We are now using AI to optimize the processes. So it's no longer an engineer which is saying, I need to tweak the system and I can change the processes in, in this way. It's AI coming with proposals itself, 
looking at the process, seeing where there are defects or weaknesses and saying maybe if you change this it can be improved. Uh, so these are starts of real transformations uh, which are really going to change the world we live in. Max, we know that Germany is known for its high quality manufacturing and smart manufacturing and engineering, of course, while China is uh, becoming a global manufacturing hub for high-end products. How is German companies leveraging uh, their strengths uh, of both countries and their policies to really innovate and make cutting-edge products uh, for the global market uh, through collaboration? I think this is a, a very good and productive marriage, put it that way, of these two uh, competencies uh, uh, coming together. The big advantage which we have in China is the scale and the depth of the, the business environment, in particular in the manufacturing area. It's much easier to scale up, the market is large, than it is in Germany. So there's a, a lot of competence moving to and fro. And as a matter of fact, if you look at uh, our structure today, when we are designing new factories, in many cases it will be teams in China which are taking the lead on designing certain factories which will be built in, in the rest of the world. One comment I would like to make is I think one should not reduce the capabilities of China to that of being a strong manufacturing and uh, supply chain hub. It is, of course, but if I look at the future where I see the real chances for ZEISS uh, and for China moving forward is in the fact that China is really driving ahead in the areas of innovation. So today we have a very strong footprint in terms of manufacturing and supply chain in China, which we'll continue to invest in and, and expand. But where we are really growing now is actually on innovation. Innovation with our own people in China, but also innovation with partnerships in Chinese companies where we are now developing products and solutions in China, which are then not only for the China market, but also being exported globally. A very good example of this is what we're doing today in the new energy vehicle area, in particular in quality control of batteries, where currently we are developing solutions together with the top Chinese companies who are leading globally. And we are actually now exporting these solutions together with them or to other companies in the rest of the world. So really we see now a, a move around where it's also technologies we have developed in China as a German company being used to re-export outside of China. That's a great example of uh, collaboration and uh, you know, working together on R&D and uh, you know, consolidating supply chains of which uh, both sides have a stake in. Mr. First, you've been living in China and working in China for over a decade. How do you see China's transformation and modernization and, uh, like you yourself put it, transforming from a world uh, workshop, sweatshop back in the day, to a leading innovation hub? I mean, what worked? I think this was really very long-sighted policies on the side of the government, which have been consistently investing to build up the capabilities of China and really not deviating from these lines for the last basically 30 to 40 years and always adding on, doing investments at the right time where sometimes the return only came a decade later. If you're investing in research and development, you do not expect a result in the next two, three years. You will see that result 10 years later. So when I started uh, here in China, I was amazed at the level of investments in research and universities for microscopy devices. We are now seeing this result in the innovation coming out, which is fantastic. At a personal level, I think simply the, the growth in standard of living in the last 15 years has been incredible, where basically if I look around myself, where I live, the people I do, the, the changes in lifestyle have been really remarkable in China on a now top notch. And then you have all these Chinese specificities, which really China is leading. If you look at the mobile environment, the mobile world, talk about WeChat, the payment systems, China is miles ahead and the rest of the world is now learning from China on how this works and, and can uh, develop it. So for me, it's been a fantastic transformation also with the company of moving from what was basically seen as a large market to a manufacturing base and now really a source of innovation in itself, homegrown innovation out of China, 
some of it only for the China market, but a lot of it extremely relevant for the complete world. Yeah, but on the less optimistic note, some 80% of human information is obtained through the eyes. And uh, like you said, WeChat is hugely popular in China, but the flip side of it is a lot of people, especially the young people, are uh, WeChatting the heck out of themselves, to be honest. Uh, the global prevalence of myopia and nearsightedness is concerning, with China's myopia rates reaching over 47%. What recommendations as eye company chief um, would you have for eye health care in China and perhaps globally? This is a real significant problem and this is unfortunately one, one area where, where China is leading which is not such a great thing. So you're talking about 47% myopes. I think a number which is even more concerning is that actually close to 80% of college students have myopia and of those 25% have high myopia. High myopia is when you're past minus eight or worse. And the problem with high myopia, it's not only a problem for you seeing, it is going to create a real problems in terms of healthcare in 15, 20 years, because there are a lot of topics and issues of eye health which come up from myopia. Not only being able to see properly, but you have problems such as retinal detachment, things which can really lead to blindness. And this is going to be a massive topic. So here we must look really at what we can do in terms of prevention, of myopia management, control progression, and then basically of solutions. So we see this as a company and we're working with the authorities along these three steps. And then we provide solutions either in terms of eyeglasses or refractive surgery. More complex becomes with young kids. And this is how do you manage myopia progression? And here we've had very strong focus as a company working with local government and authorities and research institutions to see if we can develop and we have developed products which aim to slow down the progression so that basically a kid we may not be able to reverse myopia but at least make sure that the myopia does not get as bad as it would have before it stabilizes. What we really must do is a topic of prevention. Prevention comes from lifestyle change. In the end, uh, the best way to slow down and reduce myopia in kids is no phone and no iPad or reducing it in small children. It's terrible seeing small kids. Sometimes you go to the restaurant, things like that, and parents simply put the phone or the iPad in front of the kids uh, to keep them quiet, and during the whole meal, they are looking at it. In Germany, this it's like that too? A little less. There's a big environment in China. It starts with the kids, then it's at school, a lot of work, a lot of hours. So recommendations reduce the usage of handheld devices and increase the time of the kids outside. Send them outside to play football, do things, because the eye then adapts to looking at far, near, different environments. If you stay in a closed environment, so if you're working all day, if you're on your screen all day, your eye isn't working, it becomes lazy, and this seems to be one of the major drivers of actually myopia progression. So it's lifestyle changes which really will do a big change. And then we can come in with our products to try to slow down the progression and support it, but you can have a big impact by just changing the lifestyle. Max, thank you so much for coming in and for sharing your thoughts with us this morning. Thanks. That's it for this edition of The Hub on CGTN. Thank you so much for tuning in. Our news coverage continues. Bye and take care. <laughs>